doesn't matter what Satan throws at the sound. We're going to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. All righty. How you guys doing? Good, right? I can't believe you guys. How many guys here last night? Raise your hand. I can't believe you came back after those two freaky messages. But praise God, you guys are troopers. Troopers, like the jacket. I knew you had to come see the jacket. It's curtains.com. You know where to go for all your curtains. Yeah, you know it's true. You know it's true. I hate to give away my secrets, but anyway, that's right. I digress. But uh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Very interesting choice of songs because that's really the theme of our study uh, as we kind of balance things out if we got freaked out last night. But it's a good freak out because it gets us motivated to stop procrastinating, stop being worldly, live for Jesus, and share the gospel. Amen. That's all good stuff, right? It's all, all it is. GetLifeMedia.com, as you can see there, is our teaching website. 13 years worth of material, basically, that you could watch, download, share for free. We also have on there documentaries. We've got uh, a plethora of books. We have uh, also DVDs. We don't copyright our material, so if you ever get the DVDs or what have you, uh, make a billion copies, give it away. We don't care. Uh, everyone has an opportunity for people to pray and receive Christ their Savior. It's almost like we Christians in the last days need to be getting shared in the gospel, right? Well, that's what we're trying to do, making it easy for you. How many guys uh, uh, have a hand? Raise your hand. This guy asks a lot of questions from Vegas. What's up with him, right? How many guys got a hand to spare? Okay. Uh, and a lot of people say, I don't know how to win. Can you do, do, do this with one of your hands? Go like this. There, you can witness. That's what we do. DVDs, whatever, tracks, do something. Something beats nothing. But getalifemedia.com, that's where you need to go. Or for those of you, I'm not even going to ask this question. You guys freaked me out yesterday. I guess turned about spare play. Uh, but hey, for those of you who are out of your house, that means you're mobile. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but if you want to uh, download our app, it's for free. Just search for my name. Uh, and you can download that for free. Basically unlocks the website, same thing, but now you're on your phone, your tablet, and things of that nature. So you can always uh, stay in touch if you want to get freaked out even more. But uh, we're in the last days, and there's something more important than just knowing that we're in the last days. It's called being a witness for Jesus Christ. And it's one thing to say and to share. It's another thing when we back it up with our countenance. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but usually if a Christian walks around saying they're a Christian, but looking at their face, it looks like their diet consists of sour lemons, pickles, and prunes. That's not a good witness. And it's concerning the days that we live in. It's evil. We're not condoning that. But we have something better. We have a future that nobody can take away that's beyond our wildest dreams. And that needs to reflect on our countenance. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much, God, for, again, this conference and a great time that we get encouraged in your truth. And now as we take a look at your word and how we're supposed to respond to being in these prophetic last days. And God, if we're off track, and, and in all seriousness, if our countenance is not a good one, and we're sending a duplicit message, hey, come to Jesus, but we're freaking out just like everybody else, get us back on track. May we be consistent. May they just, even before we open our mouth, the way that we live, the way that we even look, our countenance would draw people to you. That they would see hope in us and joy. 
So God, please, if that's the case, get us back on track. And as always, God, if there's anybody here who's not truly saved, please save them today. May they have the joy of your salvation before they leave this place. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, I don't know if you guys heard what's going on with Eric. Eric had some challenges getting here. He had to take a taxi, apparently. It's a joke. Just work with me. <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyways, so hey, and he's a newbie at a taxi, apparently. He'd never been in a taxi cab before. So he taps the taxi cab driver on the shoulder to ask him a question, obviously. And, and But as soon as he did watch this, the taxi cab driver, he screamed bloody murder. He lost control of the car. He nearly hits a bus. He goes up on the footpath. He stopped just inches before the shop window. And for a second, everything went quiet, and the, and the driver said, Hey, look, buddy, don't you ever do that again. You scared the daylights out of me. And Eric, he's, he's going, Man, dude, I didn't realize a little tap on your shoulder could scare you so much. And the driver calmed down. He said, Hey, listen, listen. I'm sorry, man. It's not, it's not really your fault. You see, today is my first day as a taxi cab driver. And for the last 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. Hey, wait a second, man. Once you finally understood the context of that guy's fear, it's kind of justified, right? Okay. But in all seriousness, folks, uh, believe it or not, uh, I don't know if you noticed, he's not alone. Okay. Uh, many Christians, have you noticed this, are scared out of their wits like that guy. And it isn't just from a tap on the shoulder. It's from turning on the TV Ooh, and all this stuff that's going on. And I'm here to encourage you, we don't have to live that way. In fact, we shouldn't live that way because, again, that's not a good witness. And we need to simply learn how to be thankful in the last days. And if we're going to do that, then we just need to remember three important biblical truths as we walk during this time frame. And the first one is God's in control of some things. No, what's it say there? All things, okay? But don't take my word for it. Uh, let's listen to his, Psalm chapter 2. Man, if you ever find yourself getting freaked out, read Psalm 2 and go to sleep. Okay, but this is, this is the one who is in control of all things. His name is God. But listen, it's not just he's in control of all things. He mentions specifically these guys in the last days who are trying to throw off his reign, who are, who are thinking that they're going to install their king, they're gonna, the Antichrist. They're going to install their new world order, the Great Reset. And watch God's response to this. This is so applicable to today, right? But Psalm chapter 2, for those of you hooked on phonics, how would you say that? Psalm. But that's not how you say it. But anyway, just say, I'm stalling time again. You guys are getting there. Uh, Psalm chapter 2, that's right. Psalm chapter 2, uh, verse 1 says this. Watch this. Why do the nations conspire? You know, just like today, they're trying to take over the world. And the people's plot in what? Vain. <laughs> the kings of the earth, you know, Schwab and Gates and all these guys. They take their stand. And the rulers gather together against who? The Lord. Against his anointed one. That's Jesus Christ. Let us break their chains, they say, and, and throw off their fetters. And God, the one enthroned in heaven, what's he doing? <gasps> no, what's it say? He laughs. And then the Lord scoffs at them. And then he rebukes him in his anger. And then he terrifies him in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king, Jesus, on Zion, on my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You, Jesus, will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. Why? For his wrath can flare up in a moment. But blessed are those who take refuge in him. How many guys have taken refuge in Jesus Christ? Well, turn to somebody and say, praise God, I'm blessed, right? And that's what this text is. It's very important, folks, to get us uh, to say here. You go, well, why, why are we blessed? Because, hello, we belong to God. And, 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 and that's why we're blessed. He's on the throne, right? He's always on the throne. He's never not on the throne. That means he controls all things, including Klaus Schwab, including Kill Gates, I mean, Bill Gates, and George Soros, and Joe Biden, believe it or not. God is the one that is in control, folks, not these guys, right? Even though they're trying to throw off his fetters, his coming reign of his son, they ain't going to stop it. It's all in vain. And the point is this. God doesn't just say he knows this, he's in control. But what's his reaction to these guys trying to usurp his authority? <laughs> Are you serious? You guys think you're going to stop me, God, and you're going to stop my son, the Lamb. The line of the tribe of Judah. Who can stop the Almighty? Nobody. And that's why God's laughing. He's not freaking out. He's not going, man, they're putting up a good fight. I hope it works out. Angels, could you send me a report on how's it going? What's the percentage? Am I going to win? Am I going to lose? He ain't doing that. He's laughing at these guys. 
Why? Because God doesn't lose. He never loses. He can't lose. He'll never lose. He's in charge. He's in control. He's on his throne laughing at these guys. That's why we're blessed, because we belong to him, which means what? We're not the losers in any equation. We're the winners, because God never loses, and we belong to him. And these guys, no matter what they do, God is going to have judgment day. He's going to have the last word on it, and he's going to install his king, Jesus Christ. He's going to rule and reign over the planet, the millennial kingdom. We get to rule with him, and nobody can stop it. And so here's my point. When you take a look at this passage, every time, folks, really, how, here's how you translate it. We're not condoning the evil, the wickedness. This is real. These guys are wicked. They're working for Satan. This is no joke. But every time that we see this information, we see another thing that they're doing. We see another move that they're making with their pandemic, with the, with the Great Reset. And they got this goal of 2030, and, and they're going to put all this stuff and the thing really we need to go back to psalm chapter to remind ourselves who god is we belong to him we're blessed and really when we see that news we need to translate it with laughter (laughs) have you ever had one of those moments where you got the giggles in the wrong place (laughs) right it's like this guy this this really happened this is not a joke it's not a parody this really happened in an interview watch this Jij had een normaal leven daarvoor ja. en toen plots kom je uit narcose en dan merk je dat het leven niet meer hetzelfde zal zijn. Hoe reageer je daar dan op? Ja, uh, eerst met heel veel ongeloof. Ongeloof is eigenlijk het juiste woord. Excuseer. Ongeloof is eigenlijk het juiste woord wat lijken hier hanteert. Omdat... Dat was bij mij dus ook mijn eerste gewaarwording. Dat ik dacht, dat, dat kan niet. Dat, uh, dat me... Dat... Excuseer. Excuseer. Excuseer, dames en heren. Dus, uh, je probeert dan terug uh, je toekomst... Ik begrijp echt niet sorry, wat er hier aan het gebeuren is. Excuseer. Ik even, sorry. Ik, ik, sorry. Excuseer, dames en heren. Dat betekent ook dat uh, bijvoorbeeld uh, ja, seksualiteit uh, ook een uh, groot probleem bijvoorbeeld wordt. Ja, mijn vriend heeft het gewoon uh, gedaan gemaakt. En ik neem hem daar ook niet kwaad. Mm-hmm. Plus het feit, als je, als, je met, als, als je met seks omgaat... Is het... Is het niet alleen het fysieke dat telt, maar ook soms de, de lieve woordjes. Ja. <laughs> that really happened. That's no joke. The guy actually lost his job over that. Which, which I'm not laughing about that part, but it's no joke. It really happened, man. You ever get that? The uncontrollable laughter. Now, here's my point. Psalm chapter 2, all these guys trying to, uh, thinking they're going to overtake God and stop Jesus. Are you kidding me? That's how we, see, we need to translate this. You hear news that Klaus Schwab's trying to take over the planet. <laughs> Bill Gates, I mean, kill Gates. He's trying to kill us all. <laughs> George Soros, he's buying off our government. <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, He's destroying America. (laughs) Why should we respond like that? Because God is. Lighten up, Christian. God's in control. What are you freaking out? Blessed are those who take refuge in him. These guys are not the ones who's in control. The Bible's very clear. God is in control. They're only on a short lease. They only get to do what God allows them to do. You and I need to take comfort in that. Okay, God is on the throne. Last time I checked, it's kind of a big throne. You realize that? And that's why he's laughing at these guys. These guys are pipsqueaks, man, compared to God. Are you kidding me? So let's blow our mind just to see how big God is. How, how big is his creation? The Bible says that he'll make the earth his footstool. He'll just put his feet on that. He's so big, he's so mad. But let's blow our mind. Let's see how big God's throne really is. No wonder he's laughing. Watch this.
This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. It spans 80,000 light years across and contains more than 100 billion stars. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. The brighter stars are concentrated into arms that wrap around the disk. Since our solar system is within this disk, we see the Milky Way as a cloudy band in our night sky. No human being or spacecraft has seen our galaxy from the outside, as shown here. It is difficult to grasp just how large our galaxy is. Our solar system is located here. In fact, with the exception of M4, all the stars and planets we've visited are within this little ring. The Milky Way is a remarkable demonstration of God's power. But what's even more amazing is that our galaxy is merely one of billions. Every one of these faint clouds is an entire galaxy. As we pan upward, we see a strange band where galaxies seem to be missing. This is called the zone of avoidance and is aligned with the disk of our galaxy. Although many galaxies are undoubtedly in this region, gas and dust in our own galaxy prevent us from seeing them. Further up, we see a massive grouping of galaxies called the Virgo Cluster. It contains over 2,000 galaxies and is 50 million light years away from Earth. Our entire galaxy appears as a grain of sand lost in a vast ocean of galaxies. Yet the galaxies shown here are only a small portion of the cosmos. Beyond this distance, astronomers have cataloged only certain regions of the visible universe. At last, we begin to see the large-scale structure of the universe. The galaxies are organized into a complete tapestry of strings and voids. For clarity, only a few selected regions are shown here. This is the universe, or at least as much of it as our present understanding makes possible. Just imagine the power involved as all these galaxies leapt into existence at God's command. And yet the Bible describes the creation of all this with the single phrase, He made the stars also. Too big our problems are too big for God. I hope he knows what he's doing. Hope he can do something about it. Are you kidding me? No wonder he's laughing at these guys. Bill Gates, <laughs> George Soros, you wimp. Klaus Schwab, you tiny little Juma flea. Joe Biden, you limp ball. Are you kidding? Compared to God, you're nothing. And you actually think you're going to take over the world and install your satanic kingdom and stop the reign of Jesus Christ? <laughs> Lighten up, Christian. If God's laughing at these guys, we're not condoning what they're doing. It's evil and wicked. But lighten up. We need to go <laughs> in the midst of this. And we can tell people, hey, this is real. But see this smile on my face? You can join me one day in a kingdom that no man can stop. It's going to be run by Jesus Christ. His bride, the church, is going to be with him. And you want to be there. That should be our countenance, not freaking out. God is in control of all things. He can handle these guys, folks. Lighten up. The second truth that we need to realize is this, that God can fix all things. God can fix all things, okay? And we see that in the scripture uh, uh, very clearly. I'm going to give you just a few of them. And, but sometimes it's like, do we not believe this? You know, we see how big God is. He's powerful. He can do, he controls all things. But can he really fix anything that you go through? Absolutely. And the, the Bible is very blunt about this. Let's take a look at this first passage. Jeremiah uh, 32, 17 says this. Ah, Lord God. Now, notice the context. And notice the exclamation point. It's not, ah, oh, Lord God. Right? It's, ah, oh, Lord God. Yeah. Why are they so excited? What did we just watch? This is the context. You saw that video. What did it do? Whoa. And that's what Jeremiah says. Behold, God, I just watched that video. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. What's the logical biblical conclusion? Therefore, whoa, nothing is too difficult for you. Do you get it? It's not just, wow, God's in control. Whoa, he's kind of big. That means nothing's too difficult for him. 
And folks, that's what we need to understand in these last days. And, and, and I'm telling you, right, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let me give you some other passages in Scripture that tells us, it, no, there's no problem too big for God. Are you kidding me? Right? Matthew 19, 26. With man, this is impossible. But with God, what? How many? All things are possible. We quote it all the time. It's on T-shirts, bumper stickers. Do you believe it? Genesis 18, 4. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. In fact, he says this, I'll return you at the appointed time next year. And Sarah, at 90 years old, will have a son. Whoa. How many ladies at 90 years old would like to have a baby? <laughs> you know, I was actually pastoring in New York. I asked that question one time. And there was a lady on the front row. Her name was Lillian. Her husband was Larry. Great godly couple. I kid you not. I was just doing, you know, playing with you around. I said, hey, how many ladies? Would like? She actually raised her hand. <laughs> you should have seen Larry's face. <laughs> no joke, man. On tape. It was hilarious, right? But God could do it. Not just back then. He could do it today if he wanted to. Isaiah 59, 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Job 42, 2. I know, I know that you, God, can do all things, and no plan of yours can be thwarted, right? Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? What's the answer? No, why? Because he's kind of big. He can take care of everything. He made the universe out of nothing. He's so powerful. He's so big. No wonder the scripture says, ah, Lord God, look at that. Whoa. Turn to somebody and say, hey, take a chill pill. <laughs> what are you freaking out over? I get it. These guys are trying to do what they're doing, and it's real, and we need to deal with it. People need to know. But we don't need to be freaking out. We know the one who's in control of all things. He's on the throne. He's always on the throne. He's never not on the throne. And guess what? I don't care what we go through. Even in the last days, God can fix it. All means all. Nothing to, it means nothing. And I bring this up because you hear the conversations of those of us that are rightly being instructed, like you'll get at this church from Pastor Matt, you're getting the whole of the Bible. One third of the Bible deals with prophecy. We need to understand prophecy. God tells us prophecy for a good reason, many good reasons. It's good for you. But you hear sometimes that Christians will even translate it, though, in an unbiblical way, and they start freaking out because you hear the conversation. Well, what if, uh, what if we're still here before the rapture happens, and they institute the cash of society? Now, it's not the mark of the beast. A Christian will never deal with the mark of the beast because that doesn't happen until in the seven-year tribulation. Most would say the halfway point, and we're out of here prior. But still, they could launch a cashless society. What are they going to do? What if Klaus Schwab and the gang release another pandemic? Because they've talked about it. You heard the latest thing? The bird flu. Better watch out the bird flu. What if Joe Biden gets reelected? Ugh. That's a reality. But you're hearing Christians go, Ugh. it's like, what? are you kidding me? God is in control. And even though we might have some difficult times before we're out of here, God can fix anything. That's what we have to understand. Nothing is too difficult for God. He can fix any problem at any time. And I don't know if you've learned this as a Christian. God even fixes things before we even know they're coming. All right, let me give you a couple of true examples. Watch this. Years ago, a fishing fleet went out from a small harbor here on the East Coast. And in the afternoon, there came up a great storm. And when night had settled down, not a single vessel of the whole fleet had found its way into the port. So all night long, the wives, the mothers, the children, the sweethearts, they're pacing up and down the, the beach. They're wringing their hands. They're calling upon God to save their loved ones. And then, to add to the horror of the situation, one of the cottages caught fire. But since all the men were away, it was impossible to save the home. And when morning broke, to the joy of all, though, the entire fleet found its way into the harbor safely. But there was one face, which was a picture of despair. It was the wife of the man whose home had been destroyed. And, and meeting her husband as he landed, she said, Oh, husband, we're ruined. Our home and all it contained was destroyed by the fire. Watch this. But the man is saying, Thank God for that fire, because it was the light of our burning cottage that guided the whole fleet into port. Wow. He knows what he's doing. Even when it doesn't seem like, even when things go awry, there's a, what? I will work all things together for good to those who love him. Do you love him? He was working it all together for good. He didn't say it'd be easy, but he said, I'll work it together for good. And again, he fixes them before you even know they're there. It's called his sovereignty. It's called his providence. This is a true story. This was during World War II. A B-17 bomber was making a raid over Germany when their gas tanks were hit by the German flak fire, but for some reason, they managed to make it back home. So the next day, the pilot, reflecting on the miracle 
of a 20 millimeter shell piercing the fuel tank without exploding the plane. He goes to get that as a souvenir for good luck, you know, unbelievable. But that's when the crew chief told him, listen, there wasn't just one shell in the gas tank, but 11. 11 shells were lodged into the gas tank, and yet not a single one of them exploded. Watch this. So they sent the shells to the armors to defuse them, but that's when they discovered all 11 shells were missing their explosive charges. For some strange reason, they were clean as a whistle and completely empty except for one of them. True story. Inside that one shell was a carefully rolled up piece of paper, and on it, written in Czechoslovakian language, was, this is all we can do for you now. Now, if you know about the Hitler and the Nazis, they used a lot of slave labor. And they would have people build and work as slave labor into their factories and armories and stuff of that nature. And this was the Czechoslovakians' way of getting back. But it wasn't just that. What are the odds? Do the math of not just one but 11 shells. And they all just happened to be the ones that being fired at that time from these guys who were making dummies to get back at the Nazis. And it just... God doesn't just fix our problems. He fixes them before we even encounter them. And then he turns them around for good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. This is a promise from him. And so here's my point. I don't know how far we're into this new world order, world economic form, great reset thing, lead up that they're going to hand the keys over to the Antichrist. I know we're not going to be here for the seven-year tribulation, but how far into this lead up are we going to be? I don't know. But what I do know is God is on the throne. He's always on the throne. He's never not on the throne. Therefore, whether it's Old Testament times, New Testament times, or even in the last days, God will take care of his own. All we need to do is just believe and pray. Like these Christians, because he still does the miraculous today. Watch this. This is awesome. Not just for days, but for weeks, months, years, you cannot get rid of it. And the other continual feeling is the constant cold, terrible cold. Sometimes I felt as if my blood circulation was slowing down. I was personally amazed at the power of endurance. Because, by all accounts, I should have become seriously ill and died a long time ago. cell with a broken window. The KGB was determined to do an experiment and freeze me. Later they would say he broke the window in the cell and died of cold. I felt despair. I thought to myself, has God really left me? Am I really forgotten and neglected? Have my years of suffering been in vain? And in my despair, I began to pray. I usually pray silently, but this time I started to appeal to God out loud. God, have you left me? My cries were bursting from a heart literally in utter despair. One night, I had a dream. In my dream, I was told to pray for Alexander. I had no idea who Alexander was. But I told my church, and we began to pray for him. An 
right then, I suddenly felt a palpable physical warmth. Not the kind that comes from a heater, but like when a mother draws her freezing child to her breast and warms him with her tearful breath of compassion. It was a very living, human warmth. It penetrates you as if piercing you to the heart. And inside your heart, a spring opens up, out of which flows peace. A wonderful, magnificent, soothing peace. I felt a very loving, brotherly touch. Someone's caring hand touching my shoulder. I actually felt it. And this gesture represented the words, you are not alone. You are not abandoned. We are with you. We are sharing your suffering. This warmth was the energy God gave me to feel. Physically, the heat of prayer was my own skin, my own being. As if the prayers converted the energy of love into the energy of warmth. In the morning, it was a shock to my executioners. They couldn't understand. I wasn't simply alive, but my temperature was the same as that of a normal person. I heard the doctor explaining to my executioners in the corridor. This is impossible. We can't explain it. About six months later, we received a letter from Open Doors to pray for Alexander. And we finally found out who this Alexander was. We had been praying for six months without knowing anything about him. Alexander had started a Christian movement that spread across the Soviet Union. For this crime against the state, he was imprisoned to a labor camp in northern Siberia, the death sentence zone. It so happened that many people began praying for me. That was exactly when they released me. Prayer opened the prison doors, and as the gospel affirms, set the captives free. Christian, we've forgotten who God is. He's big. He's powerful. He's in control of all things. No man can thwart his plans. Nobody can stop him. How far are we going to be into this? Could it get worse before we get raptured? Absolutely. All I know is God still does miracles today. And if it is going to be with us, even in those circumstances, it's just going to be another opportunity for him to display his wonderful supernatural power. To blow the minds of the lost and to encourage his kids. All you got to do is trust me. Believe and pray. And have a great day. Stop freaking out. Which leads to the next thing, the third one, the final one, is that God can supply all things. He's in control of all things. He can fix all things. He's supernatural, folks. He didn't just do them back then. He still does them today. Get back to his word. But he can supply all things. I don't care how big your need is, even in the last days. I don't care how big of a family you got. Did you know God can supply it? He can, folks. Read the scripture. In fact, believe it or not, Moses, the great man of God, he started to crack on this, right? The people, they were whining and complaining, and it kind of spilled over to him, and he got caught up in it. And if we're not careful, we're going to get caught up in it. 
Watch this. I love this passage. Numbers 11. Uh, God speaking. Tell the people to consecrate themselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. Right? The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. What? Egypt, God brought them out of bondage and slavery. And if you get any of our occult studies, another thing that was heavy duty in Egypt that God delivered them from was witchcraft, the occult. Heavy duty. God delivered from that. And then they have the audacity to say, I, I went, in essence, today, a vernacular, man, I had it better off before I got saved. We wouldn't do that, would we? So God's a father. You know what dads do? You do dad lecture. And this is what we see here. We were better off in Egypt. Uh, yeah, okay. Here comes the dad, God the father. Now the Lord will give you meat. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're going to eat it. You're not going to eat it for just one day or two days or five or 10 or 20, but you're going to eat it for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. You loathe it. Isn't that just like a dad? <laughs> you don't like those peas? Oh, get ready. <laughs> but he's doing it because he loves us and he's disciplining us. Hebrews 12, God disciplines those whom he loves. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and you wailed before him, saying, <laughs> But Moses said, watch this. He gets caught up into it. Believe it. Moses, the great man of God. Here I am, God, among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I'm going to give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough flocks if the herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Moses got rebuked because he got caught up in the sin of everybody else. It did. What's going to happen? And we're going to die of food. We don't do that, do we? And folks, I'm telling you, they forgot who God is. And that's not just the only passage. Let me give you another one. They got caught up in it again later. I said, come on, have you forgotten who God is? Watch this, 2 Kings 3, 17 through 18. For this is what the Lord says. You will neither see wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. And you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is what? An easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. And he'll also hand Moab over to you. Now, if you're not familiar with this, it's another occasion that Israelites, they started freaking out. They got their eyes off of God, and they were getting low on their provisions. They were getting afraid, and they didn't just think they were going to die of thirst. They thought for sure they're going to die of thirst. Their animals are going to die for thirst. They're going to lose it all. And then on top of that, if that wasn't bad enough, here comes Joe Biden. I mean, here comes these Moabites, and they're coming after us, and they're going to kill us. We're going to die. And what's God say? Take a chill pill. He speaks to the prophet Elijah, and he says, stop. Knock it off. Have you forgotten who God is? Hello, he's kind of big. He's all powerful. Have you seen his throne lately? Look at this guy. You don't think he can supply? And he did it, right? He did it. He supplied water out of the blue for not only thousands of Israelites, but their animals. And then almost like an afterthought, yeah, I'll take care of your enemy too. Here's my point. He didn't just do that. What's the text say? I love this. It was an easy thing to do. This is chump change, right? God can supply all things. And see, we forget this. And again, sometimes, not only with God fixing all things, sometimes we act like, well, well, well that was them with the Israelites. <laughs> God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can fix any problem, right? And the last time I checked is because, what's the Bible say? Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, and how much? Everything in it, and the world, and what? All who live in that. Psalm 50, verse 10, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. God is not short when it comes to needing to supply your need. Last time I checked, owning everything on the whole planet is kind of a lot. Oh, and by the way, it's not just that, okay? He can make things out of nothing. Last time I checked, he made the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. Do you, do you think he needs a grocery store to supply your need? He don't need that if he didn't want. And here's my point. Again, this is another thing that you're hearing Christians freaking out in these last days. Even Christians are starting to, you're, well, 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 what if they fire me at my job for being a Christian? I, I won't be able to provide for my family. And, all that. and that could happen. What, what if they declare martial law and they limit our travel? And that could happen. What, what if they shut down all the grocery stores that won't have access to food? And that could happen. Well, what if Joe Biden gets reelected? Ugh, I had to throw that in there because it is a real reality. Because, you know, so whatever. But here's my point. Have you forgotten who God is? 
Even if we're still here and they bring down the clamps, guess what? We need to take the scripture and dare I say Jesus serious when he says this, Matthew chapter six. So do not what? Worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Why? Because the pagans live like that. That's not a good witness, Christian. Hey, come to Jesus. He's wonderful. It doesn't work well. Stop it. Knock it off. You're living like a pagan. They run after all these things. And what? Your heavenly father, what? He knows that you need them. So take a chill pill. And what's he say? All you got to do is this. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day's got enough trouble of its own. Deal with today. If the rapture happens happen and you wake up the next day, then live for that day. And the rapture doesn't happen, you live for that, then live for that day. He gives you marching orders. You don't just stare at the wall. Ooh. He says, hey, you live, you seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. I will take care of that other stuff. In fact, you know what's wild? I'll never forget the first time I looked this up. Worry there is the exact same Greek word in Philippians 4 when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. They're the exact same word. They're translated worry, Matthew 6, anxious in Philippians 4. It's the same Greek word. It's merimanao. You know what it means? Watch this. This is going to blow your mind. To be consumed with self. Now, that answers a lot. When do we start freaking out? When do we get anxious in life, Christian? When do we start worrying? <laughs> when you get consumed with yourself instead of the Savior. And Jesus says, you don't have to live like that anymore. You just seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, he'll take care of you. You, you just pray and present your request to God. Go have a great day. Be a godly witness. Keep that smile on your face. Walk around so where people say, hey, man, I want to I wanna slap that smile off your face. You're so smiley, I want, you annoy me. But that's a good witness. We should, have to be, we should have to pay people to slap that thing off. Because of God. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Are you kidding me? We, we have a relationship with God. We have a future that nobody can take away. Last time I checked, heaven's kind of cool. Uh, hello. Uh, and then we got the millennial kingdom and the new heavens, new earth. And it's, as the Bible says, our inheritance is kept in heaven. Nobody can take it away. You can't lose it. It's guaranteed through Jesus Christ. That's what we're headed for. It's just a matter of time. One day, woohoo! We might even skip that death part thing. Yeah! That's our countenance. And then even if we're still here and hard, hard times come, uh, God can do whatever he wants to do. And listen, how many times do we read this passage and we forget? God, even if you needed some food in the last days and things got a little stringent, you don't think he can't take care of it? He had a bird deliver food to one of his people. Oh, that was just like back then. He can't. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. This is an opportunity for him to display his supernatural power. Why are we freaking out? Have we forgotten who God is? But that, he don't even need a bird. He can do it out of nowhere. How many times do we read this? And we don't even understand what we're reading. Matthew 14, right? says this, as evening approached, the disciples came to him, Jesus, and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. So send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus said, uh, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat, right? And they, so, well, that ain't gonna work. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus said, hey, bring me here to me. Watch this. He said, and then he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and he broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to, to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And not only that, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. How many times do we read this? And it's like we miss a very important point. It isn't just that Jesus made provision for a large amount of people. How, how would you like to try to supply food for a potluck with 15,000 people? That's a lot. But then you go to the fridge and you got four cubes of butter, right? And two eggs. <laughs> he didn't just make provision for a large amount of people. He made provision out of thin air. God can do that. He made the universe out of nothing. And you don't think that he can supply for your family, your family needs, I don't care how big it is, even if he has to do it supernaturally. He still does it today. True story. This is one of my favorite all-time accounts. God will take care of his own, right? One lady said this. She said, listen, 
It was the summer of 2002, and it was a bittersweet time for me, my th- three young children, and I. And we had just moved, and needless to, needless to say, we were struggling financially. And one afternoon after picking up my two youngest kids from school, my seven-year-old son asked if we could have pizza for supper. And my heart broke a little when I replied we couldn't afford pizza. But my nine-year-old daughter spoke up and told my son that if he really wanted pizza, he should just pray because God could afford it. <laughs> True story. She says, so my son lifted up his little request to God with all the faith that a child has. And watch this. And for a split second, I envied that childlike faith. And I wondered at what point in my life as an adult Christian, I lost that ability to just believe. But during the course of prayer, my son also remembered that we were out of toilet paper. And so he said, God, could you also get us some toilet paper? (laughs) And she said, I was slightly embarrassed that he would ask the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven for such thing. But I I just let him pray. She said, well, the rest of the afternoon was uneventful. About 4.45, though, the doorbell rang. And my two youngest children went to look out the window to see who it was. And fully expecting them to tell me it was one of their friends, I was not prepared uh, for what came next. My son yells out, Mom, Mom, the pizza dude's here. The pizza dude's here. So the who? She goes, I made my way to the front door in a state of confusion. My son came running through the house. It's an angel. It's an angel. God sent an angel to deliver pizza. So she said, I go to the front door to clear up the confusion as I was sure this pizza dude was at the wrong house. And then I was worried about the disappointment my son would feel when he realized the delivery boy was uh, at the wrong house. So I greeted the pizza boy and explained that we had not ordered this pizza to which, watch this, the delivery boy says, I know, ma'am. Someone called the order in and paid for it with a credit card, and we were asked to deliver it to you around 5 p.m. Watch this. This is God. And she said, I must have been quite a sight standing there with my two daughters, our mouths hanging open in total disbelief, and my son standing there saying, see, I told you God sends angels to deliver pizza. So the delivery boy handed me, watch this, four large pizzas. He always does more. The miracle wasn't just a miracle. He, there was leftovers. There was extra. That's our God. He's not short on supply. And watch this. Four large pizzas. I carried our feast into the kitchen. I'm still in shock. And, and, and I, I just sat there t- trying to absorb what had just happened. And as I was pondering these things, watch this. My son yells out from the garage, Mom, Mom, I was looking through this box, and guess what I found? Four rolls of Charmin toilet paper. <laughs> the good stuff, not that itchy, scratchy stuff. Watch this. She said, well, apparently I packed that toilet paper in a box some three years ago from some of our previous moves. But listen, but he just happened to find it that day. She said, I just broke down and cried. I thank God for the miracles he showered us over that day. Listen to this. They lived through a hard time. But what was the synopsis? She said, the summer of 2002 turned out to be one of the best of my life. Why? Because I simply learned to believe again. As an adult Christian, no matter what it looks like. Why? Because God is good, and yes, he still sends angels to deliver pizza for his people. And you don't think that even if we're still here, and times do get a little bit tough and stringent, you don't think God's going to take care of us? You're worshiping the wrong God. I didn't say it'd be easy. I didn't say he'd have some tough choices, some challenging times, but that's where God displays his supernatural power. That's where he is glorified. That's where people begin to see he's alive and he still does miracles today. And we use that with our countenance and we lead people to him because we're not going to be, if we're still here, we're not going to be the only ones in need of provision. Other people will be. It's an opportunity for God to to declare his glory. So again, How far in this new world order, economic form, world economic form, great reset, antichrist lead up, are we going to be here before the rapture occurs, before the seven-year tribulation? I don't know. (laughs) But what I do know is this. God is on the throne. He's always on the throne. He's never not on the throne. And guess what? Whether it's Old Testament times, New Testament times, even in the last days, he will take care of us. You know what you need to do, Christian? Every day when you get up, you need to listen to the voice of God. And that is right here, and only right here. He said, I want to hear, hear a word from God. Well, read the Bible. Don't listen to those people. God told me to tell you because I had this vision. I was in the shower, and this beam of light came in through an angel that shined on my armpit, and I got a word from God to give to you. Not run from that. <laughs> you want a word from God? Read the Bible. This is the only sure word right here, and you stick to this, Christian. 
Yeah, but I want to hear God's voice out loud. Read the Bible out loud. <laughs> That's a profound thought, Vegas man. <laughs> because you hear Christians listen to everybody else's voice. And they're crashing and burning. And they're full of worry. They're not listening to the voice of God. The way out of this, until the rapture happens, is we need to listen to God's voice and only his voice, Christian. And he will lead you home safely. Like this pastor learned. Watch this. This is cool. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much, but I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you gotta do it, you gotta do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought well one good thing it's shiny then he walked around it we got in he's on the left front I'm on the right front the other lawyers sitting right behind me and he started it up and it started up just fine well we taxied out I said should we pray he said yeah that's a good idea we normally don't I said well this time we're gonna and I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing and it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes and something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out, passed out. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, Tell, we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned and he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. 
He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage, and there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices. And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, Thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning knock at my door and I opened the door and a man was standing there he said hello David I said you're the voice you're the one who got me home he said I am do you understand one day you're gonna stand before him and say you were the voice you're the voice that brought me home if you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me and I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. Amen. If you would just listen to his voice. That's it. The cross will lead you home. To a place beyond your wildest imaginations. A destination. We're not there yet. But if you listen to his voice. Whew, the journey might get bumpy. You might experience some turbulence. But listen to his voice. And that's only from the Bible. How far are we going to be into this before we're out of here? I don't know. Don't take this wrong. I don't really care. I just want to listen to his voice and do what he says to do, to finish strong with a proper countenance on my face because I take him at his word that he's in control of all things and he's laughing at these guys trying to take over the planet and I'm blessed because I belong to him. He can fix any problem that I go through. He fixes them before I even encounter them and works them together for good. And if I'm still here and I need a need, he can supply it. 
don't worry about your life. Don't be anxious about anything. You listen to his voice and only his voice, and he'll take you through. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much for a wonderful biblical counterbalance. It's so easy to get caught up in this world. And on the one hand, we need to know what's going on. In fact, one third of your word deals with future events, and so you want us to know the future. But it's not designed to get us to freak out and crash and burn. If that's how we feel, we're, we got to get back to your voice. Your voice tells us to chill out, lighten up, and not forget who you are. And not forget how much you love us as your children. And you will take care of us. Not just in the Old Testament times, not just the New Testament times, but yes, even in the last days. So God, if we're here today, and lately, frankly, we've been kind of crashing and burning. Get us back on track in your word. That we put our mind on things above, not on this earth. We listen to your voice. Get back to your voice. Not the voices of other people. Not the voices of YouTube false prophets and other people. God, please get us back into your word. And not just for us, so that we would calm down, but that we'd have the appropriate countenance that the lost, dare I say, are probably waiting to hear from us and see from us. Do you really believe what you say you believe? That Jesus is God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and nothing can stop him? Do you really? It'll show on her face. And then we could lead them to you. And God, again, maybe there's somebody here who desperately needs to listen to your voice because they need to be saved. And your voice tells us that you are holy, we are not. The wages of our sin is death. We deserve to die, myself included, and go straight to hell. But your voice also tells us, but because you love us, you sent us your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to take the death penalty in our place so that we could be completely forgiven. And since he did all the work, it's a gift, and so we have to receive it by faith. And so, God, if there's anybody who has not done that yet, may they obey your voice. May they cry out to you, Jesus, even now, right where they're at, and ask you to forgive them of all their sins. You tell us if we do that and confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that you, God, raised him from the grave, we will be saved. That's what your voice says. That's the only way out of this. The cross is the way home. God, if anybody needs to do that today, may today be their day. And may they join us in having something called the joy of salvation. But thank you for our study today. Please bless it to these lives that belong to you. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen.